Greetings, my fellow Freedom Blood Sovereign Thinkers, the L3 Viewers Podcast. My name is Craig Trans, meeting from the beautiful Swampy Mango, South Florida. And today's date is Tuesday, April 16th, 2019. Looks like I have a little issue or some of the ordeals on my podcasting. It's been like dropping. I'm going to have to do a little cleaning as usual. You just smack me later for it. Interesting stuff is going on. Well, I'm going to make this one a little short. Do a couple, we'll do a couple of them, and um, first we're gonna start off here by the Rutherford Institute, which I am a member, active member, active member, supporting member of this organization. It's entitled "From Jesus Christ to Julian Assange: When Dissident become, Dissidents Become Enemies of the State." As it reads here, in the universal time, in the universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. That's a quote from George Orwell. When exposing the crime is treated as committing a crime, you are being ruled by criminals. In the current governmental climate, where laws that run counter to the di- dictates to the dictates of the Constitution are made in secret, passed without debate, and upheld by secret courts that operate behind closed doors, obeying one's conscience and speaking truth to the power of the police state can render you as an enemy of the state. The list of so-called enemies of the state is growing. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is merely the latest victim of the police state's assault on dissidents and whistleblowers. On April 11, 2019, police arrested Assange for daring to access and disclose military documents that portray the U.S. government and endless wars abroad as reckless, irresponsible, immoral, and responsible for thousands of civilian deaths. Included... Among the leaked materials was gunshot video footage from two U.S. AH-64 Apache helicopters engaged in a series of air-to-ground attacks, while American air crew laughed at some of the casualties. Among the casualties were two Reuters correspondents who were gunned down after, the, after the, their cameras were mistaken for weapons and the driver who stopped to help one of the journalists. The driver's two children, who happened to be in the van at the time it was fired upon by U.S. forces, suffered serious injuries. There is nothing defensible about crimes such as these perpetrated by the government. When any government becomes almost indistinguishable from evil claims to be fighting, rather that evil takes from the form of war, terrorism, torture, drug trafficking, sex trafficking, murder, violence, theft, pornography, scientific experimentations, or some other diabolical means of inflicting pain, suffering, and servitude on humanity. That government has lost its claim to legitimacy. These are hard words, but hard times require straight talking. It's easy to remain silent in the face of evil. What is harder What we lack today and so desperately need are those of moral courage who will risk their freedoms and lives in order to speak out against evil in its many forms. Throughout history, individuals or groups of individuals have risen up to challenge the injustice of their age. Nazi Germany had Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the the Gulag of the Soviet Union were challenged by Alexander, so Heisenstein, America had its color-coded system of racial segregation of war marketing called out for what it was blatant discrimination and profiteering by Martin Luther King Jr. And there was Jesus Christ, an itinerant preacher and revolutionary activist, who not only died challenging the police state of his day, namely the Roman Empire, but provided a blueprint for civil disobedience that would be followed by those religious and otherwise who came after him. Indeed, it is fitting we remember that Jesus Christ, the religious figure worshipped by Christians for his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection, paid the ultimate price for speaking out against the police state of his day. In radical nonconformity, challenged authority at every turn. Jesus was a far cry from the watered-down, corporatized, simplified, gentrified, sissified vision of a meek creature holding a lamb that most modern churches peddle. In fact, he spent his adult life speaking truth to power, challenging the status quo of his day and pushing back against the abuses of the Roman Empire. Much like the American Empire today, the Roman Empire of Jesus' day had all the characteristics of a police state, 
secrecy, surveillance, a widespread police presence, a citizenry treated like suspects with a little recourse against the police state, perpetual wars, a military empire, martial law, and political retribution against those who dare to challenge the power of the police state. For all the accolades poured out upon Jesus, little said about the harsh realities of the police state in which he lived in the similarities to the modern day America, and yet they are striking. Absolutely, it's like history repeats itself, you know what I'm saying? So I'll continue on here. Secrecy, surveillance, and rule by the elite. As the chasm between the wealthy and poor grew in the wider in the wider in the Roman Empire, the ruling class and the wealthy class became synonymous, while the lower classes increasingly deprived of their political freedoms, grew disinterested in the government, easily distracted by bread and circuses. Much like today, with this lack of government transparency, overt domestic surveillance and rule by the rich. The inner workings of the Roman Empire were shrouded in secrecy, while its leaders were constantly on the watch for any potential threats to its power. The resulting statewide surveillance was primarily carried out by the military, which acted as investigators, enforcers, torturers, policemen, executioners, and jailers. Today that role is fulfilled by the NSA, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security, and the increasingly militarized police forces across the country. Widespread police presence. The Roman Empire uses military forces to maintain the peace, thereby establishing a police state that reached into all aspects of a citizen's life. In this way, these military officers used to address a broad message of routine problems and conflicts and force the will of the state. Today, SWAT teams comprise of local police and federal agents and are employed to carry out routine search warrants for minor crimes such as marijuana possession and credit card fraud. The citizenry with little recourse against the police state as the Roman Empire expired, expanded. Personal freedom and independence nearly vanished, as did any real sense of local governance and national consciousness. So similarly, in America today, citizens largely feel powerless, voiceless, and unrepresented in the face of a power-hungry federal government. As state and localities are brought under the direct control by federal agencies and regulations, a sense of learned helplessness grips the nation. That's why I am pro Tenth Amendment, my friends. Perpetual wars in the military empire, much like America today, with this practice of policing the world, war, and an overarching militist ethos, provides a framework for the Roman Empire, which extended from the Italian peninsula to all over southwestern, southern western, and eastern Europe, extending into North Africa and Western Asia as well, in addition to significant foreign threats. Wars rate were rage against inchoate, unstructured, and socially inferior foes. Martial law eventually, Rome established a permanent military dictatorship that left the U.S. citizens at the mercy of an unreachable and un an oppressive totalitarian regime. In the absence of resources to establish a civic police forces. The Romans relied increasingly on the military to intervene in all matters of conflict or upheaval in provinces from the small-scale scuffles to a large-scale revolt. Not unlike police forces today with their martial law training drills on American soil, militarized weapons and shoot first, ask questions later mindset the Roman soldier had, the exercise of lethal force at his fingertips with the potential of wrecking havoc on normal citizens' lives. A nation of suspects, just as the American Empire looks upon its citizens as suspects to be tracked, surveilled, and controlled. The Roman Empire looked like all, look upon all potential subordinates, from the common thief to a full-fledged insurrectionist, as threats to his power. The insurrectionist was seen as directly challenging the emperor, a bandit or revolutionist, was seen as capable of overturning the empire was always considered guilty and deserving the most of the most savage savage penalties including punish capital punishment bandits were usually punished publicly and cruelly as a means of deterring others from challenging the power of the state Jesus execution was one of such public punishment As I continue on here, an act of civil disobedience by insurrectionists, much like the Roman Empire. 
Okay, so guys, I continue here. Act of civil disobedience and insurrectionists, much like the Roman Empire, the American Empire has exhibited zero tolerance for dissidents such as Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and Chelsea Manning, who exposed the police state's seedly underbelly. Jesus brand himself as a political revolutionary, starting with his act of civil disobedience at a Jewish temple. In the site of the Ministry of Headquarters in San Herdin, the Supreme Jewish Council, when Jesus, with the help of his disciples, blocked the entrance to the courtyard and forbids anyone carrying goods for sale or trade from entering the temple, he committed a blatantly criminal and seditious act. An act that undoubtedly precipitated his arrest and execution because the commercial events were sponsored by a religious hierarchy, which turned was operated by consent of the Roman government. Jesus' attack, Jesus' attack on the money changers and traders can be seen as an attack on Rome itself, an unmistakable declaration of political and social independence from the Roman oppression. The Mavericks are good. The military-style arrest in the dead of night. Jesus' arrest account. Jesus' arrest account testified to the fact that the Romans preceded him as a revolutionary. Eerily similar to today's SWAT team raids, Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night in, a sec in secret by a large, heavenly armed fleet of soldiers. Rather than merely asking for Jesus when they came to arrest him, his pursuers collaborated beforehand with Judas. Acting as a government for informant, Judas concocted a kiss as a secret identification marker, hinting that a level of deception and trickery must be used to obtain the seamlessly dangerous revolutionist cooperation, the torture and capital of punishment. In Jesus' day, religious preachers and self-proclaimed prophets and nonviolent protesters were not summarily arrested and executed. Indeed, the high priests and the Roman governors normally allowed a protest particularly a small-scale one to run its course. However, government authorities were quick to dispose of leaders and movements that appeared to threaten the Roman Empire. The charges leveled against Jesus that he was a threat to the stability of the nation, opposed paying Roman taxes and claim to the rightful king. You're purely political, not re purely, purely political, not religious. To the Romans, any one of these charges was enough to merit death by crucifixion, which was usually reserved for slaves, non-Romans, and Rom-Romans, radicals, revolutionaries, and the worst criminals. Jesus was presented to, the Pontius, to Pontius Pilate, a disturber of the political peace, a leader of a rebellion, a political threat, and most gravely, a claimant to kingship, a king of the revolutionary type. Yes, gonna hear a cement truck coming by. Sorry about that, friends. I will continue on here. After Jesus is formally condemned by Pilate, he is sentenced to death by crucifixion. The Romans' means of executing criminals convicted of high treason. The purpose of crucifixion was not so much to, to kill the criminal. It was immensely public statement, intended to usually warn all those who challenged the power of the Roman Empire. Hence, it was reserved solely for the most extreme political crimes, treason, rebellion, sedition, and banditry. After being ruthlessly whipped and mocked, Jesus was nailed to the cross. As Professor Mark Lewis Taylor observed, the cross within Roman politics and culture was a marker of shame of being the criminal. If you were to put the cross, you were marked as shameful, as criminal, but especially as subversive. And there were thousands of people put to the cross. The cross was actually positioned at many crossroads. And as New Testament scholar Paula Fredrickson has reminded us, it served as kind of a public service announcement that said, act like this person did, and this is how you will end up. Fear is a great weapon, right my friends? Jesus the Revolutionary, the political dissent and the nonviolent activist, lived and died in a police state. Any reflection on Jesus' life and death and within the police state must take into account several factors. Jesus spoke out strongly against such things as empires, 
to trolling people, state violence, and power politics. Jesus challenged the political and religious belief systems of his day, and worldly powers feared Jesus, not because he challenged them for control of thrones of, or government, but because he undercut their claims of supremacy and he dared to speak truth to power in a time when doing so could, and often did, cost a person his life. Unfortunately, the radical Jesus, the political descent who took aim at injustice and oppression, has been largely forgotten today. Replaced by a con congenial, smiling Jesus, tried it out for religious holidays, but otherwise rendered mute when it comes to matters of war, power, and politics. Yet for those who truly study the life and teachings of Jesus, the resound theme is one of the outright resistance to war, materialism, and empire. What marked a what a marked contrast to the advice being given to Americans by church leaders to submit your leaders and those in authority in which the American police state translates to complying, conforming, submitting, obeying, and deferring to authority and generally doing so whenever a good government official tells you to do. Tell Americans to, to march in lockstep and, blind, and blindly obey the government or put their faith in politics and vote for a political savior flies in the face of everything for which Jesus had lived and died. Ultimately, this is a contradiction that must be resolved if the radical Jesus, the one who stood up to the Roman Empire and was crucified as a warning to others not to challenge the powers that be, is to be an example of our modern age. As I make, my, make clear in my book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, we must decide whether we follow the path of least resistance. We're going to turn a blind eye to what Martin Luther King Jr. referred at to as the evils of segregation and the crippling effects of discrimination, to the moral degeneracy of religious bigotry and the corroding effects of nar narrow secretism, to economic conditions that deprive men of work and food, and to the insanities of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence or whether that we will be transformed nonconformists to dedicate to justice, peace, and brotherhood. As King explained in a powerful sermon delivered in 1954, it says here, This command not to conform comes from Jesus Christ, the world's most dedicated nonconformist whose ethical nonconformity still challenges the conscience of mankind. We need to capture the gospel glow of the early Christians, who are nonconformists in the truest sense of the word and refuse to slap their witness according to the mundane patterns of the world. Will they sacrifice, sacrifice fame, fortune, and life itself in behalf of a cause and they knew to be right? Quantitatively, quantitatively small, they were quantitatively giants. Their powerful gospel put an end to such barbaric evils as infanticide and bloody gladiatorial contests. Finally, they captured the Roman Empire for Jesus Christ. To hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciple, though disciplined nonconformists who were dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. The trailblazers in human, academic, scientific, and religious freedom have always been nonconformists. In any cause that concerns the progress of mankind, put your faith in the nonconformist. Honesty impels me to admit that transformed nonconformity, which is always costly and never altogether comfortable, and it may mean walking through the valley of the shadow of suffering, losing the job, or having a six-year-old daughter ask, Daddy, why do you have to go to jail so much? But we are gravely mistaken to think that Christianity protects us from pain and agony of mortal existence. Christianity has always insisted that the cross we bear precedes the crown we wear. To be a Christian, one must take up his cross with all of his difficulties and agonizing the tragedy packed content and carry it until the very cross leaves this mark upon us and redeems us. That more excellent way that comes only through suffering. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the stuff in my chest. Getting rid of my stuff in my on my chest. So, 
In these days of worldwide confusion, there is a dire need for men and women who will, who will courageously do battle for truth. We must make a choice. We will continue to march to the drumbeat of conformity and respectability. Or we will or will we or will we listen to the beat of a march beat of a more distant drum to move to its echoing sounds. We will march only to the music of time or will we risking criticism and abuse march to the soul saving music of eternity. Interesting things that questions to think about my friends it doesn't matter what your creed is but you always gotta look at things in the bigger picture I mean that's why I don't go around Christian bashing or hating Jesus Christ because you got some status sleaze bags out there who wants to use this, this character's name in vain nothing new at all all form of mind control but basically study the, the Bible itself during the times of Jesus Christ, he was a nonconformist, a maverick, a rebel. And I always commend that. And there's many characters in the, this book, in, the, in, the, in that book, perta um, pertains mavericks and rebels. He's just one of them. This is why we gotta stick to people who stand on principle. Julia Assange is a political prisoner, like I said on my sh last show. If we let this guy rot and don't say a word, it will blow back on every single one of us. Guarantee you that. Bending over for the system gets you nowhere. It'll give you a big slap in the face in the long run. And one great quote Thomas Jefferson made, saying, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. And as I recall, Benjamin Franklin wanted that as a um, nation's motto. In my view, that would have been a lot better than in God we trust. That was part of American heritage, being rebel rousers, mavericks. That's how I look at it. Hopefully everyone out there will do the same. Alright, so the next one here. Be one more. It's from the New American. Came out today by written by C. Mitchell Shaw. It's a reference to what happened in um, the, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral. Been around for 800 years. It got burnt to the ground. I know a lot of folks are questioning. There's some investigation. Don't be surprised they're going to blame the Yellow Vest or ISIS. You know, ISIS is a New World Order platform. People that know her, my show, for a long time, I always uh, stick to that. And I know there's multiple, other multiple churches, too, before that have been desecrated, vandalized. And I could, and I could thank uh, Dan Dixon Press for Truth and the gentleman from Red Ice, Red Ice, Radio, uh, Red Ice TV. Which Red Ice TV, which he's very good, even though he's, he's facing more in a European perspective, but he's very good. He was he did a real good job on it, and um, it's mainly about the dark days, you know, the dark dark days of uh, of Europe, because he b always believed that it was a European heritage got to, got a lot of it got destroyed, and we have to look at things too about the Notre Dame, Notre Dame um, Cathedral. I'll be very frank; I'm not a fan of the Vatican. Okay, with all due respect. However, the structure from that cathedral was beautiful and amazing. Some work in there that's been done since like the late, like the mid to late 13th century. So yes, a piece of history of Paris has um, may have perished. But the question is this: by Mitchell Shaw, see Mitchell Shaw, Notre Dame survived. How about Christian Europe? As it reads here, Notre Dame Cathedral has stood for 800 years. It survived the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. It survived World War I and II. Monday night, the cathedral stood on the brink of destruction due to a raging inferno that has severely damaged the French Gothic structure, toppled the spire, and caved in the roof. 
a symbol of Christianity in France across Europe and around the world. Notre Dame narrowly survived Monday's fire. But what, but what of the Christian faith that the cathedral symbolizes? Beginning with the baptism of Clovis on Easter Day in 508, France became the first Christian nation. That played a major part in the history of France, Europe, and the world. As part of the Christian heritage of France, Notre Dame Cathedral was built, was built beginning in the 1160 and mostly completed by 1260. Generations of the craftsmen spent their entire working lives building Notre Dame, with many of seeing their labor as act of worship of God to God. Henry VI of England and had had his coronation as as King of France there in 1431. In 1804, the coronation of Napoleon I, Bonaparte, as Emperor of France, was held there. In fact, it was in 1801 that Napoleon signed an agreement with the Holy See allowing the Catholic Church to resume control of Notre Dame. He made provisions to ensure that needed repairs would be completed in time of his for his coronation. Notre Dame has been the site of royal weddings dating back to the wedding of James V, King of Scotland, and Madeline of Val Valois in 1537. Much repair work between 1801 and 1804 in preparation for Napoleon's coronation was needed because of the damage done to the cathedral in the dark days of the French Revolution. During the barbarism of the revolution, Notre Dame, which had already seen damage at the hands of King Louis XIV, was viewed by the enlightened Jacob in revolutionaries as a symbol of the power of both Christianity and the monarchy, both of which were targets of the revolution. The cathedral was ravaged with sculptures and statues destroyed and the roof stripped of much of its lead, lead, for, the, lead for the making of bullets to be used by revolutionaries. Many minor bronze bells were smelted down to forge cannon. Through the great bell somehow escaped that fate. Perhaps worst of all, the building itself, constructed as a place of worship to God and for his glory, was repurposed into a church for, for the aesthetics. Cult of Reason in 1793 before schism within the ranks of the revolutionaries led to the cathedral becoming a church for the deist, the cult of the supreme being. During the same time, the cathedral was used as a warehouse by the revolutionaries. Desecration was only the beginning of the indignities the cathedral would witness. The vandalism and pillaging of the cathedral combined with the religious and historical ignorance of the barbarian revolutionaries led to 28 statues of Bible kings being beheaded since the revolutionaries mistook, mis mistook them for French kings. All other statues, with the exception of one statue of the Virgin Mary, were destroyed. The statue of Virgin Mary, for whom the cathedral was named Notre Dame de Paris, French for Our Lady of Paris was perhaps only spared because revolutionaries called Opter as Marinine, the goddess of liberty. Once the French Revolution was finally over, Napoleon, as above mentioned, allowed Notre Dame to return to the control of the Catholic Church and begin the needed repairs. Even when Napoleon's arrogance and avarice caused him to divorce himself from the Christian faith in a rage war both across Europe and against religion, Notre Dame was safe. The cathedral again saw dark days during World War One. It was shelled by the Germans in 1914. The fire caused the lead that sealed the roof to become molten hot and run down, igniting the pews inside the church. During the shelling, several stained glass windows were destroyed along with many pillars and statues, according to reports by the Washington Post at the time. World War II was, was again at a trying time for Notre Dame with German occupation a foregone conclusion in Hitler's hatred of Christianity well known. The cathedral's famous stained glass windows included the three rose windows that date back to the 1200s were removed and taken away for safety. They were reinstalled only after France was liberated from Germany at the conclusion of the war. Notre Dame as a symbol of Christianity has withstood the attack for those who are its enemies because they are the enemies of the faith for which it stands as that symbol. Monday's Inferno can also be seen as a symbol. The fire stood a very high chance, real chance of destroying the cathedral. Even if that happened, thank God it did not. The reality for which Notre Dame stands would have remained. 
stories as stories emerge, the survival of Notre Dame is one amazement after another. The fire raged for more than nine hours. The damage is the greatest the cathedral has ever seen. The roof collapsed, the spire toppled, but the edifice remains. Through mass, though mass was being said in the cathedral when the fire broke out, everyone was able to escape. No injuries have been reported. A Paris fire brigade captain, Father Jean-Marc Fournier, who was hailed as a hero after he tended to the victims after the 2015 terror attacks in that city, is being called a hero. This time, he entered the building, burning building and retrieved priceless relics to save them from the fire. According to a report by CNN, one of the relics he rescued from the fire is a fragment of the crown of thorns forced on Jesus during his passion. Other relics that escaped the fire included a fragment of the cross on which Christ was crucified. The rose windows appear to be intact. Major bells, which have already escaped destruction in the past, were also preserved. This includes a, bur- a burden named Emmanuel, which ha- has rung for hundreds of years to a mark major events in France, including the end of the world wars and in, so- in solidarity with the United States after the terror attacks of 9-11. Perhaps the most amazing picture to emerge from the aftermath of the fires is of the candles, lit by the faithful in prayer in hours before the fire broke out. The CNN reports of the aftermath includes a picture of those candles even after more than nine hours of intense heat and the falling of the debris, even all even with all of the water used to fight fire to fight the fire. The picture shows the candles intact and still burning. A symbol of prayers for the faithful going up to God. With the fire extinguished and the edifice intact, there are already plans to rebuild. French President Emmanuel Macron has reached out for the world to raise the needed funds to restore Notre Dame. As for as of the writing, nearly one billion dollars has been pledged to the restoration of the symbol of Christianity. Funds have pledged by wealthy individuals, companies, and religious groups. Notre Dame will be rebuilt. Thank God. The enemies of God and man have tried for 2,000 years to destroy Christianity. Tried to destroy Christianity, tried and failed. Even largely post-Christian France, the Christian faith is still part of the subconscious thinking, at least for the French people. While the fire was burning, the firefighters worked to contain and extinguish it. The streets of Paris were filled to overflowing with people kneeling and praying and singing hymns, asking God to save the cathedral and help Paris, all of France, Europe, and the world to bear the pain of what they were witnessing. God has answered those simple, faithful prayers. It is a sign that France may again turn to God. It is a good sign Clovis would be pleased. It's interesting, too, because I was watching the video on what was going on with uh, Miss, with uh, from RTR, Resurrected Republic Media, talked about, they got a video clip of um, some of the protesters, the old professor protesters still going on after the day after the, uh, the cathedral was burned. And it's still disturbing over there right now as we speak, as I speak. But one thing I know for sure, people gotta start really like look at themselves too, as individuals. Be liberated. Get rid of all this government dependency programs. And Macron, don't get me wrong, I'm real critical of him too for being a bankster's bellboy and a possible new, I'll say new world order asset. This is why I always uh, like to see historical moments, monuments, regardless, you know, regardless. Keep these things beautiful. Hopefully they rebuild it. And I know they got a lot of work. They have some, I was like, some watching some videos, they had some early stuff that's been going on as well. Even though a lot of churches are being uh, burnt, are being decim- desecrated before this occurred. So, like I said, expect to try to blame ISIS or the yellow vest. It's possible, but don't fall for it. Observe responsibly. It could be, hopefully, if not the case, a Paris's Reichstag. I'm not saying it's out of paranoia, but in good faith. So, one of those things. Always cherish life. And everything around you. Never take this for granted. Because it can go away into oblivion. And I know some, some, you got some people mocking it. You know, karma and white supremacy. That's all garbage. Bunch of trolls. 
I, don't, I, I, I was I was very disturbed when um, U.S. occupied when the United States occupied Iraq, and there was even reports about the gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, is not the same. So, hey, it affects all of us. It affects European heritage. Don't get me wrong, and Christianity or Catholicism, but it's part of history, not just for Europe, but for the world. Westerners doesn't matter. Even the Easterners will appreciate the characters of cities. So, like, make sure in good faith that this will be done honorably. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us on our social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you said something that's interesting you want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to the quorum. Plus, I will leave the footnotes of this episode on my Spreaker page. All right, my friends, once again, thank you for your time. But always remember that the maniac resistance helps the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love. May your guardian spirits be with you.